Revelation chapter 3, and we'll begin reading around verse 7. And I want you to notice right off the bat what it's saying about uh, Philadelphia. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. Write a letter to the church in Philadelphia and tell them, okay, I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing right now, and tell them the things that are written down in this passage of Scripture. This letter is to that church. It's to the missionary church that I was talking to you about a moment ago. It's not for some church that is back yonder in history that blew it and is not doing the work anymore. It's for the church that's alive today in this world that's supposed to be doing the missionary work, okay? And the letters are being written to them, okay? For them to listen to what's going on, what God has to say. You're on with me now, right? That's why we, we forget that those letters who they've written to. Everybody says, well, that was broke me. Well, you're in this church today. And this church today was, was organized and started back in 1800. So said, well, this thing was written in 96. Jesus was prophesying to the church of Philadelphia back then. And it, it came into the realm of the missionary church. Sure, there was a church in Philadelphia. But the missionary realm of this right here came into, into that point around 1800. And this is what the, the Bible scholars and girls think it all pinned it down to when it come down to. They're pretty good at math. I'm not. Okay. I know twice, two, twice times two is six, ain't it? <laughs> I got myself figured out. All right, now, it said, These things says he that is holy. Write this down. These things saith he that is holy. All right? Now, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, shut up and no man open. Now, when it said that he did, he's holy, it means that, that he's, he's been sanctified. Let's put it that way. You're sanctified for a position and that's the only way you can be holy. We can go, to, we can go over to 1 Peter. I'll, I'll turn and read it to you real quick. Go that way. 1 Peter... Chapter 1, okay, here, 13. Wherefore, guard up your minds with your mind, be sober, and hope to end, hope the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you in the revelation by Jesus Christ. Hoping for the grace that that's the end. Everybody knows that we're all hoping to be in the rapture one of these days, right? Yeah. That's what he's talking about with the grace here. We're all hoping that we're going to go out together. As obedient children, Facing not yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. So when we're into this, this church, a missionary church that we're talking about today, the realm in the church is starting to turn around just a little bit. Because Ricky was preaching here in the church the other night that when somebody gets saved, they just turn their back on the Lord, walk right back out there, like nothing happened. They didn't get saved. The Bible says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Amen. If you think that God saved you just so you don't have to change your lifestyle, you don't have to do anything, you can just go on and live in the way that you are, you need to read this book. Because this book tells you that it tells me that I am a missionary. You are a missionary whether you want to accept the fact that you are not. And he's hiding that to this church. You don't have to be in Philadelphia to be in the church of Philadelphia. Amen. Okay? This, this church that we're in today, I believe, very much is the church of Philadelphia. Also, the Laodicean church is there. But that missionary mind that we have, if we're born into the family of God, there's things that we're supposed to be responsible for within ourselves. And our own missionary work would be just done in the life that we live. The world is full of people out there today that, that they don't see that much difference between the church and the world. Amen. So why would I need to change? All I have to do is say that I 
I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm saved. I don't have to change anything. I can still go where I want to go and still do anything I want to do because I'm saved. I'm eternally saved. I'm just going to tell for my life the way I always lived it. I'm saved now and I can go to heaven. You're going to send people to hell. I mean, that's the, that's the, the bright fact. You've been slipped the counterfeit. It's not the truth. Because if you can live your life the same old way that you did before, you did not repent because you didn't feel guilty of your sin. And if you're not guilty of your sin, nothing's going to happen. Amen. You have to turn from it. That's what repent means. And if we're just walking around and we're in our cloud, you know, that little cloud of, that, that our world has got us in, and nobody else is allowed to enter that, but we're about to do anything we want to in that cloud, and honey, we're in trouble. Because the world is looking at you. Amen. They're looking at you. And I'm going to give an example here, and I'm not, I'm not prejudiced in this, I want you to know this for a fact. There is no way that I would stand anywhere and call Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson the man of God. Okay? And I'll tell them to their face. They are not men of God. Because men of God is not going to condone violence. They're not going to condone bigotry and, and putting somebody else down because of the color of the race and calling somebody else a racist when they're, they're just not going to do it. A man of God is going to try and bring peace in this kingdom. They're going to bring love in this kingdom. They're not going to bring something in that's not going to be fit to eat. And I don't want to eat anything that ain't holy. Amen. I mean that, church. I, if it ain't holy, I don't want it. Amen. And I'm not talking about physical food. I'm talking about nourishment that comes from the Word of God. Something I can take and live by and live for and be an example to somebody out there that might be lost and dying and going to hell. Amen. I've been trying to come up with a slogan here for the last few days about bridging over doctrine in the church. And it's starting to come around. It's starting to come around because church doctrine is sending more people to hell than drugs and alcohol is. Been saying that for a long time too. And that's coming in its own. It's been proven. There's drugs and, and, and alcohol right in the church of God. Amen? We pick on little things that we won't allow in the church. We will allow that to just wander in any time it wants to. Come in and take charge. Take, take over. I got to go over a little bit. Let's go over to Second Peter. I turn all the way over to you. Second Peter, chapter three, verse ten. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise; the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. You remember where Jesus, John said that Jesus would separate the chaff from the garner and their work would be Second Peter just a couple pages over. That they would be burned up with they would burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. They would burn out, be gone. That's what he's talking about here again. Seeing that they, that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought to be in the holy conversation and godliness, looking for the hastening into the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens bring on fire and dissolve the elements, and the elements dissolve, and the, the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. You remember when the planes flew into the towers and they said, there was no sign of those bodies anywhere, some of those that come out of the windows. That's what happened. They just melted with fervor heat. In Vietnam, when napalm was sitting on, on somebody and they got hit, if it was on their body, some of them would just burn out straight through the hops. Their bodies would still be, have that napalm, all that stuff on them. And their bodies were just burning on the thing with the top. Dave Reaver was one of them. They put him on the top. He was covered and he burnt from one end to the other. And he just burnt right through the top. That 
napalm on him. He just kept eating and turning up. Melton, right there in front of their face, they had to get him put out in order to save his life. The first thing you had to do was get him put out so that they could save his life. That stuff just sticks and just keeps on burning. Now, further he was talking about when they said that those people just melted and when that, that airplane flew in there, that heat got so hot that they're just fake. So your body is so much percentage water. Some of your scientists would know how much that is. And the biggest majority of it is supposed to be water, liquid. And I like to think that the liquid I have in my body is that Holy Spirit water. Amen. Amen. Because you can't melt that. They ain't no heater down no more can melt that water. You meant not that Holy Spirit. Okay. So, first Peter is where I was at just a moment ago, right? Okay. I'm not going to read any more of that. I've had another. I'm going to go back to the revelations here. Okay. Sanctification means it to be set apart. And when the word sanctification means sanctification, set apart. It means that everything is sanctified by in the holiness by the Word of God. If God's Word is not in it, if it's not God saying that this is the way that it can be, then it cannot be sanctified. If it's something that's contrary to the Word of God, don't try to sanctify it with the Bible. Because when you do, the only thing you're doing is sanctify it with your flesh. Our flesh will get in the way of the Spirit every time that we allow it to do. Allow it to happen. Amen. I remember reading about Daniel when he just went and opened up the window and looked out. That's all he had to do. He didn't have to say no prayer. He did it religiously. That's something he did. He knew that when he did that, that God was going to be there waiting on him. And then when he said something, he got it done. Because that's where his point and place was. He went to talk to the Lord at every day. And them other people knew it too. And they said, well, we can get him. All we got to do is just keep watch on him. He'll break it up. He'll go in there at that window and start praying again. It's exactly what happened. Because the lions couldn't eat him. Y'all read the story about the women lions? They couldn't touch him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wouldn't bow. They wouldn't bend. They wouldn't burn. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. They would not. They would not. It couldn't, couldn't happen to them. Why? Well, because there was too much going on inside that body. Too much God was inside there. And Christ hadn't come yet. He said, these things I do, you can do also even greater than these than you do because I go to my Father. All this in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. When he calls us out, we can do it exactly the way that Jesus did when we were standing and the disciples saw him as he ascended into the heavens. The only difference is it's going to be a moment we're gone. Twinkling to an eye, we're gone. But it's going to happen in the same manner. All those things that happened before are going to happen again. The graves are going to burst open. But this church that we're in right now is one of the most important times in the church's life because, church, we are in the last days. Amen. And this world is so corrupt out there Amen. that we've got to have missionaries that are out there telling what's, what's, what's happening and what's coming about. Because if we don't, the devil's going to take the world with him. Now watch this. Some of me, some of you, maybe some of yours. Uh oh. Got sober, didn't you? Got sober. You see, the devil knows exactly who you are. He knows what you are. He knows. He also knows who Jesus is. Probably better than some of, some of us do. I'm not going to admit that, but I know the devil knows. He probably knows more about him, but, but he ain't, ain't going to believe in him like I do. I can tell you this right now, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, the devil can't stop it. Amen. And the devil can't stop you from, from going to heaven either. But Jesus sure can. He can stop you from going in that ascension of the way going to heaven. He can cause your loved ones to reject the word of God and deny the cross and take the mark of the beast when the tribulation period starts upon this planet. He can cause them to do it. 
I see Brad coming here every, every Sunday. He's got that little girl there beside him. No, them two are untouchable. They're always together. You see one, you see the other one. And there's a lot of moms and dads that are that way with their children. But there's coming a day when even parents that think they're all right with the Lord or think it's fine. That if the rapture takes place, the baby be taken out, they'd be left behind. The baby going to heaven, they go to hell. To never be able to see that child again. That's the real world. That's the real message for God. It's not you're going to go to heaven and you'll be floating around the prayer with a little heart playing that little heart and just little wings on the back of your body. And that's not the way heaven is. You may be going to a state of mind, honey, but I'm going to a city that's builder and maker is God. That's where I'm going to live. But this thing that we're talking about, David here in this, this passage, we're going to read some more on this. And I'm going to give you some insight here that, that you're going to know that that, that this scripture is very, very correct in what I'm doing. I've got to set it up. It's got to be set up. So that's what I'm doing now. All right. Now, one thing about it, if we'll find out. We're going over the truth here for just a moment now. John chapter 14, we've got to read a little bit about the truth because without the truth, you can't be set free. Okay, John chapter 14. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here and then we'll, we'll move on. Uh, verse 6, verse 6 and 7. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Now, but by me, and then what he just got done said, plain and simple. You're going to come by me or you ain't going. No other doctrine, no other way are you going to go. It's simply the fact we're going by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father. That's it. Amen. No other way this man can be saved. Now, here we go. If ye had known me, you should have known the Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. And Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how says thou, show me the Father. Now, go over here to verse 17, 16 and 17. No, 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Did Jesus say that? What does he mean telling me I need to keep his commandments? He just saved me, didn't he? You mean you're telling me that I can't go out and just sin any time I want to and, and uh, let other people go to hell watching me do stuff that I shouldn't be doing? And, no. You mean to tell me that I can do that? I can't do that anymore. Okay. Now, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comfort, that he may abide with you forever. Watch this. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. The Holy Spirit not only dwells with you, he will be in you. Now if the Holy Spirit is inside you, he should be rejecting, he should be rejecting the sin before it gets into your body. But now if you allow it to keep coming in and coming in and coming in with no rejection, then watch what happens. The Holy Spirit just backs off and says, well, go ahead and turn him over to a reprobate mind. That's what he wants anyway. It's the Scripture. It's Scripture. There's got to be something inside you that's wanting to be cleansed. And I'm going to tell you the best way for you to feel like you just took a bath. Go tell somebody about Jesus. Just go tell them about the cross. Tell them about Jesus. You feel like you just took a good washing, buddy. But I've never walked away from somebody that I witnessed Jesus to yet that I didn't walk away feeling full of the Spirit and knowing.
one that God was there and that had blessed that, that person I was witnessing to. Somebody said, well, if he walked away from our cussing you, it was still a blessing. Because he got off some word. He wasn't thinking about this. He said, man, I was an idiot there. I was an idiot there. I've had to go back to me, to me and tell me they were sorry they did it. And I've had others keep laughing about it. I told him, I said, well, God will show you. <laughs> He'll show you. You know, just go ahead and laugh. He'll show you. Now, i got to go into the Old Testament a little while. We're not going to, I told you, we're not going to stay real long. <coughs> but I want to go to the, into the kingdom book. And I want to go over to 2 Samuel chapter 6. And I want to set some things up here. But before I go, you can just go ahead and go over it. I want to read another passage out of, a little bit of this out of Revelation. Still the seventh verse. These things says he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath, he that hath the key of David. Okay, he hath the key of David. He openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Okay. Now, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit from, from uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6. Just a little ways here, and then we're going to go over to chapter 7 of 2 Samuel. Do I need to hold on for just a moment? I don't care about it. It's okay. You're not? Okay. And I want to read. And talk just a little bit about David. And. I want, to, I want to be preaching the message on this later, so I don't want to cover it all now, okay? Because I know that it's already in the making for me to put it. God's already put one together here, but I, got, I want to preach this one a little bit later. But this one's got a, I just want to hit some of the highlights of it today. So David would not remove the ark of the Lord unto him and to the city of David, but David carried it inside to the house of Obedim, okay? And the Hittite, Hittite, and the Ark of the Covenant in the house of Obedon, Hittite, three months, and the Lord blessed o o Obedon and all his house. David saw that all the blessings was on the house of Obedon, but it wasn't too long ago before that that Uzziah was killed. And David was, he was upset with God. He was upset because he, he, got, he was dead. But then when he saw what happened with the Ark of the Covenant after it went to, to uh, Obadiah, he said, oh man, he said, this guy's getting rich. God's blessing him. And he sent all this stuff. So David was allowed to go get the Ark and bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Why was he allowed to do that? Because the blessing of Abraham and the blessings of, of the Moses' rod and Aaron's rod and the buddy and everything that took place inside the Ark of the Covenant, I started getting that tangled up. But all that stuff that took place inside the Ark was a symbol of a blessing and a covenant with Abraham that, and the children of Abraham that those 12 tribes had blessings come because of their obedience. Not because they were disobedient. Every time they disobeyed, it was taken away. As long as they were in obedience, it was there. Now, tell me what that means about the covenant of God today. He made a covenant. If you're in obedience, he's going to honor that covenant to the maximum. But now, if he does not, if you do not stay obedient, can he do you the same way that he did Israel? Listen to me. God does not make excuses. You may make excuses to God, but God does not make excuses. God don't say, well, I have an excuse. I can do it. God has the power and the right to do it because he is almighty God. And if you don't want to suffer their hand in the wrath of God, why don't you just try to live a little bit for him? Well, I love him so much, I'd die for him. He don't want you to die for him. Christ did that. He wants you to live for him. Amen. He wants you 
want us to be the missionary church that he's talking about. I believe that beyond a doubt that if this church wakes up, I'm not just talking about this one, I'm talking about this one, the, the church of Philadelphia. If it wakes up and takes on the role that it's supposed to take, we've got more power, buddy. We've got more power on this planet than any of those bombs has got. And it doesn't take a whole bunch of them. It don't take a whole bunch of people in order to take that. Just scatter them out all over the world. Let them go and watch the work, come back to work. But I'm going to read some more here. And it was told David, saying, The Lord hath blessed thee, the house of Ob Obed-Edom, and pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. And David went and brought up the ark of God to the house of Obed-Edom, unto the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when they bare the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatness. When they had gone six paces, six paces would be equivalent to like 18 feet. Is what it would be like. You take take an 18 feet stopping and, and offering a calf or a cow or an ox. Walking on six, six more paces, and all of a sudden you start to take a picture of Christ as He's walking, carrying the cross, the new covenant cross of Christ. You see, David was carrying the ark of the covenant. Jesus was carrying the cross, the new covenant. Believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved in your house. That's what he was carrying. And David, as he's carrying this ark, and the men are bringing it, and they're doing a sacrifice, watch what David does next. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a leather, leather ephod. That's just a, a linen ephod that you put over your, your shoulders and down here. He was totally naked everywhere else. But he was dancing before the Lord. He was there with no nothing to cover him, his shame or anything. Adam and Eve had a fig leaf. He had nothing except that thing draped over the top of him. And he's dancing in the streets, making songs and melody before the Lord. He didn't care anything about nothing else that was going on. The only thing he had on his mind was the ark of the covenant, the promise. It's back where it needs to be, and I'm going to celebrate with God. Amen. I want to do what I'm supposed to be doing because this is where the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be to start with. God gave a promise to us, He didn't give it to them. Amen. Now it's coming home, it's coming back. So He's dancing straight in the streets, and then He goes back into the house, and we'll read this to you. Verse 20. And David returned to his house to bless his household. And Michelle, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel. How glorious was the king of Israel today who had covered himself. Today in the eyes of the handmaids. His servants, as one of the main fellows, shamelessly uncovering himself, calling him a common pervert. How glorious you were. Do you know that when the Holy Spirit starts moving on some people, somebody's going to get offended. They don't understand it. And something they don't understand, they're going to get mad at or be offended at. You know, if it happens here in this church and I feel God in it, let it happen, buddy. Just Amen. let it go on and happen. I ain't going to be the one to say, hey, boy, she was acting in herself or he was. I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to say it at all because I don't know. But I can tell you this much right now. I do know for a fact that when God moves, somebody's going to know it. Amen. 
He's going to know it. If he moves on anybody in this church, you're going to know when he moves. It's up to you whether you move or not. Yeah. I had a, a guy tell me one time his mom told him, he said, I've been, honey, I really felt somebody should have shouted in the church this morning. He goes, better than my mom, I didn't get If you felt like somebody should have shouted in the church, it should have been you. Yeah. He said, well, I wasn't sure how it, anybody else would take it. It don't matter how anybody else takes it. If you feel like shouting the praises of the Lord, you get up and shout. Amen. Well, they'll make fun of me. They made fun of Jesus. Who cares? Well, I don't want nobody laughing at me. The devil's laughing at you because you're sitting there and I'm doing nothing. Amen. I've got you shut up. Some missionary you are. <laughs> Did you hear him talk to you? Yeah. I hear him talking to me all the time. Don't do him no good. I told you, he even calls me his son sometimes. I ain't your son. <laughs> Not son. I ain't your son. I know you need to be doing to me. I ain't your son. Now, and David said to Michelle, I, it was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all the house on his house, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel, therefore I will play before the Lord. He is the one that chose me. He's the one that ordained me. He's the one that told me to go preach. And I'm going to preach. Out of all them people out there, he called me to come preach at Galilee Baptist Church. I'm not preaching until y'all run me out of here. If you run me out of here, you're not going to hear me out there in the parking lot. <laughs> God tells me to go there, that's where I'm going. And tell me, tell me I can't preach somewhere else, I'll go talk to the mailbox people one there. They can't go away and run me out there except for beds, buddy. They don't want to get me there. I'm going to preach. But I thank God that he gave me a church, a pastor, that I can come in and mentor people before that maybe they can win somebody else to Christ. Amen. You know, when I first got saved, <clears throat> if I'd have known a little bit more than what I was then than I did, I would have been in danger of us. I still want some people with the Lord, but man, if they told me I didn't know what I told them, I'd pray to whoop them. <laughs> I'm serious. I had a black guy in the, the garage one day when I was witness to him, told me I was going to hell and I got mad at him. I said, you can't put me there, dude. But I'm fixing to send you there because it was straightened up. <laughs> you know, one of them deals. But when he starts telling you, you it's, open, it's okay to use open rebuke, but you got to bring it out of a kind of heart. And the country, your spirit's got to be down there with it. You know that you're a sinner too, and you've been brought out of something before you can help somebody get delivered from something. Amen. If you're not there, it ain't going to happen. But almost everybody that had been born grown up like I was, <laughs> all kids should have been. That's how they treat the youngins when they come into church. Why couldn't they have been born grown up? I was. How many of you had kids? How many of you were somebody's kid? <laughs> I know I was. And I'll tell you what. My dad and mom loved me. And I thought they did. Because, buddy, they left monuments of their love on my backside. <laughs> I got plenty of them. But I'm telling you what. Dad and mom never, ever with me. And it hurt as bad as God's weapons does. When God gives you a weapon, you're going to know it. And you're going to know that you, you blew it. You better get it straightened up too. Now, i got to go forward here. we got to get this, this going on. Now, David then, in verse 7. Let me go ahead and finish that up. Verse 22. And I will yet be more vile than us. I'm going to do more than this. You didn't see nothing yet. You just think I was crazy out there on the street. Where do you see this? That's paraphrasing. That's funny right there. I don't care who you are. If you don't think that's funny, I can make a joke and make you laugh. And be 
faith in my own sight of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be in honor. Therefore, we shall the daughter of Saul had no child until the day of her death. I guess he fixed her, didn't he? And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about him from all his enemies. The king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth in curtains. He said, man, we're going to have to protect that ark just a little bit more. We're going to have to protect that covenant. You know, that box that that covenant's in, it represents a covenant. All that is is just a box. But what's inside that box is what's important. Amen. That covenant that God made with us, that's what's important. It's not the material that it's made out of. But David, he's got the attitude, he said, God's getting tired of camp meetings, being in a tent, and us being in houses. We got houses of cedar to live in. You know, insects, snakes and stuff when go around them cedar. It kept the book of man run off. And here, that Ark of the Covenant is in curtains. Remember the veil of the temple was in curtains? You see, now it's starting to come into effect, and you start to see what I'm going to tell you. The Ark of the Covenant, from the very beginning, was sent by God to be in this house. The cross of Calvary is where the covenant of God comes forth, and it is supposed to be forever in his house. The blood of the cross forever in his covenant. That's a covenant to us. If you believe on him, you shall be saved and your house. You can hold on to it. To that passage of scripture for everybody in your home. Amen. Because it's the word of God. But now, the thing about it is, you've got to believe in that covenant. So if you're just saying, well, God said it and that said it, it don't matter whether I believe it or not, you're wrong. You're wrong. Try thinking that you're saved if you don't believe you are. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You'll run around like your life going, oh man. And the first thing happened to you when you got saved, you know you're saved because the devil says you didn't get nothing. Amen. You, you didn't get nothing. What makes you think you got saved? You didn't get nothing. Huh? That's what it did to me. You didn't get saved. I didn't get too far until I knew he was lying to me. But Anyway, we go on with this a little way now. And he even talked to Nathan and told Nathan, he said, go and tell David, I want you to build me a house. God. Build me a house. Build me a place. I want a place to store. I'm paraphrasing. And I don't want to have to read all that, so that's the reason I'm doing this. And when he established it all, he established it for it to be in a place, it would have its place. David was put in charge of something that he didn't realize at that time was really happening to him. But if you go with me to Isaiah, who we'll go over here? Read this. And I named the scripture, Ralph probably going to jump up and quote it for me. I know he knows this. Isaiah chapter 22. And 22. I'll give you 
Give me a moment to find it.
I had to Lord to sit down yesterday, so I fell down that hurt. And I didn't have to fall that far. It didn't hurt. But buddy, when it gets down to this right here, this right here will hold you up instead of letting you down. The only way that the Word of God is going to let you down is if you get out of it. You get out of it and let it go and say, I'm not going to do that anymore. Then you just apostate the Word of God. And it's better that you didn't even believe. Than for you to believe and then turn your back on it. That's the Word. That's it, bro. That is the Word. It's better that you didn't believe nothing than to believe and then turn away from it. It means you just apostate the Word of God. Better get by it. Better get by it. Now, Bring this to a close here. I ain't even doing that first version. <laughs> Sorry. Well, one of these days, 40 years from now, he said, He that openeth, no man shutteth, and shutteth, no man openeth. Right, now, here we go. When I want to go into this stuff here, we just got done talking about how the when the spirit moves, the flesh don't like it. Do you realize sometimes your own flesh don't like it? I've seen preachers preaching so heavy under the anointing of the Lord that they can feel the power start to be manifested in them. And then they didn't like it, so they shut it up. I had one one time, I was preaching, and it got me off track a little bit. And I should have stayed with what God wanted me to do, and I didn't do it. I shut it off, went back to what I was doing, and I stumbled around there for about 10 minutes before I realized what I'd done, I blowed it out. Because I had to go do some repenting before I could finish that up. It happens. We get ourselves in the way of what God wants us to do, and we can't, we can't split explain for splutter. <laughs> That was funny, but it's the truth. It is the truth. When God gives us something to do, He'll, he'll equip us to where we can talk with understanding and tell people that His grace is sufficient for us and His grace is sufficient for y'all. We, as preachers, sometimes have a tendency to want to forget that. Okay? God's grace is the same for everybody. You lay members need to remember that us preachers need grace too. We need it too. I, I love to walk in the grace of God. I know, and I know that He's always there. I want to go with the. <laughs> you got to, you got to hear this. this. This is something I got with that key of David. I just, just I just picked up this. Yeah, this is good. Mark, you don't have to go if you don't want to. Mark one. That's not, that's not faster than the speed of sound either. That's, okay, Mark chapter 1, verse uh, 22 through 25.
It wasn't his time yet to be tormented. It wasn't his time to be done away with. But see, the devil knows that he's coming down. Read that with me again. Okay. And saying, let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth, or if thou come to destroy us, I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. Okay. Now we're going to go to Matthew 8. We're going to read something similar to what it says right there, too. Okay. Make sure you know we've got two places here. 8 and 29. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, the Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before our time? Just so you know, I wasn't just throwing something at you. It ain't time for us to be tormented. The end is not here yet. You understand? When the end comes, then you're going to torment us. But it's not there yet. I thought that scripture over a pastor, I never got that big thing that it wasn't time for him to be tormented. God doesn't give him no promises when it is. The angels in heaven don't even know when the time is. So what would make the devil think that he knows what time it is? Was them demons just saying something because the devil had told them it ain't our time yet? I think it was. Christ could very well done away with them anytime he wanted to. Put him in a herd of pigs and let him off the cliff. He could do it any time that he wanted to. But the devil convinced the demons that it ain't time yet. How many times he told y'all that? How many times he told y'all that? You got plenty of time to get your kids in, did you? You don't have to worry. You got plenty of time. There's a song out. I got plenty of time to decide where I'm bound. To eternal darkness or to heaven's crown. I may sing that again one day. I may sing it home, but I'm about to find the words again. It's a song that will bring somebody to their knees. But me, when I get to that get to that point, I start rejoicing because I know I ain't going down there. I can't hardly hang with it. I just I just get happy because I know I'm going to heaven. Amen. But the devil says, oh, have you come to torment us before our time? And I'm thinking, man, the Bible says, how many of you would have noticed that? I wouldn't have either a few years ago, but we're in the last days. Remember what I told you before? And remember when he said, Jesus said, the angels in heaven don't even know that I when the Son of Man comes. So, what would you think that I would tell you or I would know? Because Jesus didn't know at that time. He was in the flesh here on this planet. Get that, it's probably somebody who wanted to talk. But, well, you might as well. You know, the, I'll just hold it up. I don't want you to miss nothing. See, the devil doesn't know as much about me as he thinks he does. He doesn't know as much about you as he thinks he does. You see, there's things in, in your life that are hidden from him and me. You know, if what it does, it confounds the lies. Okay? If God has got things going on with you that the devil does not know about, then isn't that a blessing for you? Because I'm going to tell you something. If he finds out about it, he's going to be there to torment you with it. Okay? So if you have, let me rest you. If you have problems, 
to where that you're absolutely at wit's ends with yourself and you can't figure it out. Don't tell nobody. Just talk to God about it. You know why you don't tell nobody? The devil will hear you. Well, I never thought about that before. Joe, sure. He, he's got them ears open. If you speak a word of doubt, he will capitalize on that word of doubt, and he will bend you over with it. He'll have you crying, humble. So when he starts talking to you, reject it. And if you don't reject it, please don't say anything about it. Because he's sitting there waiting for you to say that, whatever it is. He's got them little imps up there running around to carry the message. But if you hear it, I don't, you bring it back. You see, the devil tells them it's not our time yet. He's also telling you, you got plenty of time. Plenty of time. When you, when you hear that trumpet, when they took that bugle, just fall down and start praying. That's all you got to do. That's the kind of stuff he's going to tell you. But you're saying, man, I ain't going to take no chance like that. I'm going to get my step, I'm going to get mine gone now. I'm going to be ready right now. Because I believe we're in the last days. Now, the key of knowledge in uh, Luke chapter 11, 52, I'm going to read this and then we'll close out. I'm glad. 
glad that I've dealt with New Salem Baptist Church and give my heart to Christ. Surrender my calling to preach. And then I'm sorry that I didn't stand my ground in a church that was so backward and bent and judgmental of everybody that come in and out of the door. And realizing now that my pastor was the same way. Out of ignorance that he loved Jesus. But he was so judgmental that you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't send two services in him with in the church with him without him chewing you out or something. But yet he loved me. He loved me, I knew that. And I thought that's the way I was supposed to preach it. And finally, I didn't last long. Three four years and I was out of there. And then all hell broke loose. That marine come out of me. I'm not proud of that lie. I'm glad I serve my country. Don't get me wrong. But I'm not proud of that marine mentality. Well, that's something you, they turn the switch on and then they don't turn it back off. Once a marine, always a marine. Especially the other tree. Turn it on. God turned the switch on. And then when I blew it, he turned it off. Go. What you want to do? The switch is off. But then when he brought me back in, he brought me back in to struggle. I come back in, I come back in with the anointing of God. I want it all over me to start preaching again. But honey, I had to struggle. I had to struggle to get back to where I'm at today. But I thank God for every, every mile that he's brought me in this time to set me down right here to let me preach the gospel and God bring back to church. We're a missionary church. We've got a job to do. Every head bow and every right.